Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 15 of Galileo Conquest and Dudebury Kerman. The latest addition to our elite space pilot corps is trying to rendezvous with a spacecraft in orbit. First thing he wants to do, of course, is to align the orbit here. But something is wrong. Can you see what is wrong here? This is really rather embarrassing. The descending node relative inclination is minus 169 degrees. So when I got the planes more or less aligned, I actually was aligning them going the opposite direction. So yeah, I actually need to turn the entire orbit around and go the other direction, which is going to take about 200 meters per second of delta V out there. Good news, of course, is that this spacecraft has tons of Delta V left over, so Dudebury Kerman, as long as he doesn't do the paperwork in too much detail, should be able to get away with this without anybody back in the ground really noticing that he screwed this up so badly. Of course, I'm the one that really screwed this up so badly, and I told you that in my last episode, so yeah. Uh, mistakes happen, you know, especially when you're not paying attention. And you know what? You just roll with it and laugh it off and spend the Delta V. But truthfully, the last time we flew this rocket, we uh, left a very large fuel tank on the surface. And I anticipate doing the same, unless, of course, this city is heavier than the Iota. Wait, that doesn't really parse correctly. But anyway, yeah, 210 meters per second to basically convert my velocity in my orbit into a retrograde orbit relative to its original orbit and a prograde orbit relative to its target orbit. That makes total sense, I'm sure. There we go, get our approach distance down as low as it will go and then we'll make our final adjustments for rendezvous here. For this last bit of fine tuning here, what I do is I set my uh, rocket thrust way down and that lets me fire it and very slowly move in my closest approach uh, get my closest approach down as close as is possible with a little bit of tweaking here and there. So you see six, seven, eight, we're just trying to get it down to, of course, within about 0.5 kilometers or, or thereabouts. Once you're within 2.5, that's really what matters. You can kind of brute force it from there, but the further out, the more fuel you would have to expend correcting for the curvature of the path that you are following and the relative different uh, gravitational forces felt by both objects. But there we are, and in fact, there is an object down there. Is that really the thing I'm going for? I guess it might just be. So they're making the first burn again with very, very accurate engines. Got my a close approach distance down to 0.4 meters, bring my thrust back up to 100% so we can scream in there and scare the bejesus out of this satellite, or at least scare the bejesus out of the people that are operating the satellite. They'd be like, why are the rockets all in my instruments? I'm all freaked out. I am very scared. No, I don't think that actually happens. I mean, people operating scientific instruments and collecting data, sometimes they'll see something and they'll be like, wow, that's awesome, but they won't you know, shout out. They'll be like, well, first I better verify it. Otherwise, if I say wow and nothing's here, then uh, it'll be rather embarrassing. You know, like that whole wow signal from the SETI where it was basically they were listening for signals from space and they found one that was like really, really loud and the guy wrote wow next to it. There's, nobody's ever managed to reproduce that and... There's many, many reasons why it probably didn't exist. Anyway, yeah, Rendezvous has been successful, so the Explore SETI contract has been completed. Figure we might as well get out for a little spacewalk. Dudebury Kerman here getting some exercise, well, not getting some exercise, getting some practice because he's going to have to go EVA on the surface of a planet soon. So kind of stepping out and looking at all this, he'll be, uh, you know, just getting a feel for the spacesuit. I mean, truthfully, he should have probably done that back on the ground before he left, but whatever. You'll also notice that this spacecraft was launched before certain uh, before I made a change to my Galileo install, and that kind of broke the solar panels. Anyway, now we're leaving this polar orbit. Time to perform a landing. The first thing we need to do is, of course, slow the spacecraft down. Say goodbye to your little friend because you're not likely to be coming back here. 
your consumables are rather limited. In fact, you're going to have to race back home pretty quickly. So there we go. Get that. Bring, of course, we bring down into a circular orbit. And I want to land as close to the equator as possible because landing close to the equator simplifies the return uh, maneuvering so that you don't have to worry about inclination changes or things like that. Okay, now we are in an orbit. It's time for us to decide when we shall come down onto the surface and spread hot fuel everywhere. Well, I mean, spread is the wrong word. It's more like spraying hot awesomeness over the surface. So yeah, aiming for the equator, you'll see that I drop the, the landing site kind of north of it, but once we get closer, we'll fire these engines. I mean, we're moving like 300 meters per second, 400 meters per second, so this has less gravity than the moon by the looks of things. Down below 10 kilometers here, remember that altitude is relative to, lo to uh, global sea level, whereas the altitude for the terrain, or relative to the terrain, is listed in my flight engineer window up there. So yeah, just slowing down a whole lot now, look at our longitude and latitude. We're pretty close to the equator here, uh, within four and a half degrees. We are over the Midlands biome, which is about as average as possible. We're about, we have our latitude as average as possible. We have our altitude as average as possible. And in the interest of being boring, I'm going to move down towards the surface as slow as possible. And now, I figure since uh, there is a chance I will be returning here, I have spare fuel. I, if I put it down very, very carefully, you never know, it might actually be useful for something. I mean, it certainly won't be useful if it explodes in the surface. So the trick here is to move down towards the surface very, very gently. 40 meters, that's 35, 30, 25, look at my velocity here, very slowly. I mean, we're obviously burning a lot of fuel landing this. 20 meters up. I think there. Okay. Fire that and we're out of here. Excellent. A little bit of boost upwards to uh, move me clear of where that is. It does not appear to be rolling up or downhill, which is good based on previous experiences. But Dudebury Kerman becomes the second Kerbal astronaut to land on a surface beyond the surface of Gale. Just looking at it from a few meters up, it isn't so bad. It's oddly familiar to cotton candy. The grammar on that is a little odd, but uh, I will allow it, because after all, they are Kerbals. Okay, although the place looks like cotton candy from afar, remembering what everywhere else looks like bursts your bubble. So that's the crew report. How about the surface sample? Get down there. I mean, I could do a surface sample from all the way up there, but it would look weird. The soft color soil crumbles easily and finds a place in a sample jar. Uh, I, I don't think they actually sent sample jars to the moon. They sent bags and things like that, but jars made of glass would have been very heavy. So they used like uh, sample bags instead. So let's, uh, yeah, we've got the sample. So what we should do, <gasps> you know what? I realized that this giant fuel tank here sitting with explosive fuel, that is clearly a navigation hazard and it would not be right for Dudebury Kerman to you know, leave this here without a warning to everyone. So we're going to put a flag down just to let the world know that there is uh, this giant fuel tank here. Warning! Giant fuel tanks crossing. Take care. Do not hit them. No, come on, be serious. There's a fuel tank here, and you should be extra careful not to hit it. Anyway, Dudbury is uh, is basically kind of stretched thin in terms of his uh, habitation resources. He uh, he's gonna have to get back to Gill very quickly. But I espy a nice, cool, big, awesome rock out there. Uh, in that fact, that could also be considered a navigation hazard. So I think we're contractually required to place a warning flag here just to let everyone know about the giant rock here. Warning! According to OSHA requirements, this is a big rock, and it's potentially very heavy. 
Even in the weak gravity of SETI, you need to be worried about flying into it. And interestingly enough, this isn't ground scatter, because if it were ground scatter, I wouldn't be able to stand on top of it. It is the same biome and all that. It's not like there's a special biome for these rocks. Anyway, time to jump on board my little trusty spacecraft and start heading homewards as quickly as my rocket engines will help me. So we're literally going to be burning straight towards the planet Gale right now. Just need to make sure we get up enough of a lateral velocity before we start falling back. And you, know, you always got to be careful here because, of course, if you... Uh, if you go sideways too quickly, there are mountains and stuff that will sometimes catch you off guard. Trust me, I've done it in the past. Always make sure you're going upwards when you're trying to head, when you're trying to launch off of a moon. But yeah, standard procedure for the return here. Get my velocity set up. And the next part is that I have very limited life support capabilities. So it has a couple of snack boxes on board. And I think he has something like four days to get back to Gale right now. Which means after getting his escape trajectory, he now needs to refine the, the escape trajectory to get him to the target faster than eight days. And yeah, you can see here he has five days, three hours of life support left. So basically, yeah, point towards towards Gale and kind of just add some extra velocity so that when you, it leaves the sphere of influence it's already going significantly faster and it's not relying on the force of gravity to gently accelerate it downwards. No, we are going to do a rocket assisted return that will get us there very quickly. Kind of like Apollo 13 actually did this if you remember. They wanted to bring the astronauts back home a little faster so they so, yeah, they performed a burn, like, a couple of hours after passing Peri... Peri... Kelian, not Peri... Peri Synthian with the moon, right? They basically accelerated them towards the Earth. Now, it retur it increased... Uh, sorry, it reduced their transit time by 10 hours, and that really didn't make a difference to their consumables, but it did mean that their spacecraft landed in the Atlantic Ocean instead of the Indian Ocean. However, for Dudbury, he has enough snacks... But he's beginning to get a little stir crazy. Dudebury Kerman refuses to work because of homesickness. Uh, he's returning to duty, and also we get informed that we have a transfer point to Thalia, and this is where bad things start to happen because we are falling towards a re entry trajectory, and he does not want to wake up. Dudebury, wake up! Wake up! We need you to turn the spacecraft! We need you to turn it! It's locked in stability configuration. Stability assist configuration. You're getting very hot. Hear those explosions? That'll be you next. The next explosion could be you if you do not turn this spacecraft. Please! For your... Okay, well... Sorry! Yeah. Oh look, he should have gone into that module. He would have s survived a little longer. Okay, yeah, um, so I did mention this in the past, but he was homesick, apparently, and that meant that he spent too much time in too small a spacecraft and too far away from Gale, so he got very sad. He got so depressed that he couldn't even control his own spacecraft. And now the pieces of this are falling back, scattered across the skies. He had a proper Viking funeral in real time. Previously, Dudebury was a rising star in the astronaut corps. Now he is a shooting star across the skies of Gale. If only I'd attached, like, a, a probe body or something, I could have controlled it. I could have got him home despite his depression. But I think he'd just been stuck there so long he felt suicidal. This is why you're supposed to screen pilots for these kind of things. Otherwise... They're a danger to themselves, to their equipment, and to everything around them. But on the plus side, Dudebury never ran out of snacks, and we all know that would have been really a worst case scenario. He would have been hungry and cramped and heading back to the ground. Farewell. You will be missed, you will be respected, you will be remembered, and your achievements will go straight to the R&D lab. Oh, something survived. Oh, he left some snacks for us! We shall have to research that 
I'm sure they will tell us a great many things. Well, we don't have much time because uh, we got to get on that launch window for Thalia, the transfer window. So we take a slightly modified version of the spacecraft we sent it out previously. The only difference is that we now have some new sensor systems on it for looking for fuel, resources, or that kind of stuff. So it is just basically the same spacecraft, just slightly modified. It's, well, it's a sister ship, so let us call this one Sister Assumpta. If you ever need to give things up for Lent, apparently a Sister Assumpta is the place, to, is the expert, the person to call. Again, that is a cryptic reference to Father Ted. Actually, if you know Father Ted, it's not cryptic at all. What's the word crypt? It's, it's, it's just something you don't know if you've never watched it. Okay, let's uh, get rid of this fairing here because we're going to need those solar panels. And we're going to... Oh, yeah. I should have probably checked this design, but apparently my solar panels are clicking through my antenna. Eh, whatever. The game isn't checking collisions for me. It'll let me get away with it. Finally, we have this stage in orbit. The second, the first stage will fall back to the planet on its own. And you'll see the new hardware here, which is designed to look for uh, fuel deposits, ore deposits, carbonite. All that stuff will be scanned for by this giant dish. Moving that to the front, of course, necessitated moving the antennas to the side so that we kind of kept a somewhat balanced design. Thalia is the second planet out from the sun in the Galileo system. It appears that there may be a moon here, but I haven't been able to resolve sufficient details with my telescope. As such, the spacecraft will help unlock the mysteries. It'll be an interesting question as to which, spa uh, which body I orbit first. Do I orbit the planet or do I orbit the moon? Uh, we'll have to take a guess at that once we get in close, but that will take hundreds of days to get there right now we have uh we're gonna have many many other missions in the meantime and of course we're also gonna have several other launch windows and we're gonna have to send those off long before we start getting space probes to planets there so yeah we have our maneuver set up we have our orientation set up we just have to wait for the time to set up well, there we go beautiful sunrise over the plains or the mountains or the green squiggly I, what is it? that looks like fingerprints or like oh no it looks like scabs that's what it looks like man i thought that planet looked pretty now it is in my head that those look like scabs or maybe that's the space probe just becoming self-aware and looking back maybe we trained this probe with uh, ai and it, and to get it to go we have to convince it that the planet that it came from is terrible so it's like no those aren't beautiful land masses those are scabs you want to go on this mission i know you're afraid but you really don't want to be orbiting a planet that looks like this it, you could get all sorts of space probe diseases from that so no you want to have that incentive to go into deep space. Look, I'm not saying that's how these artificially intelligent probes go. I'm just saying there will be some point in the future where you have to make arguments like that with super intelligent, socially aware AI. So that's our escape vector. And now we need to set up our next maneuver here. So I'm just going to basically adjust the maneuver here. It's inefficient. But, again, extra Delta V, we're probably quite capable of getting to it and getting into orbit and investigating everything with our fuel reserves we have. We're a little heavier because we had to add some more instruments, but I think this is, this is going to work. So yeah, I just need that little course correct node there, and then we can set the time, sorry, we can set the alarm clock to that. And then finally, having done all the work we can... We can spend a few moments at the end of the episode admiring the planet Gill as we slip its bonds of gravity, slip the chains of gravity, and float off into deep space, headed for new shores, new territories, new discoveries. But of course, we will have to find out about those in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>